to be with you today. Uh, if we've not met, my name's Ryan. I get the honor and privilege of being on our teaching team here. Uh, I need to figure something out about Covenant Church, though, before we jump into today's message. Is this a Longhorn Church? Is this a... They walked in a little bit more confident than last week, okay? Uh, is this a, a OU or Baylor, uh, uneducated? Woo! Uh, is this Cowboy Nation? I'm trying to... Oh, so some of you will shout for the boys, but you won't shout for Jesus, huh? Okay, no, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. No, it's, we're so glad that you're here, whether you are a fan of football or, or not. We believe that God's in your corner. And we want you to know who God really is. We, we stress that. And I just have to say, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed this series that we've been called Win in Rome. We've been looking at the book of Romans. I believe Pastor Amy was put on the planet to teach the word of God. And uh, she's been doing a fantastic job throughout this series. Pastor Mike as well. And I want to pick up where Pastor Amy left off last week in Romans chapter 8. I believe that Romans chapter 8 is one of the most important chapters in all of the scripture. In fact, the first verse we're going to look at, I think, is one of the most important verses in all of scripture. Romans 8 verse 31 says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I could spend the entire message just talking about this verse. I believe the entire gospel is encapsulated in just this verse. God is for you. Let it sink in your soul a little bit. Let it change how you think. Let it change how you treat people. Let it change how you go to work. God is for you. I don't know what you've been told about God. I don't know what you've believed about God in the past, but maybe you have worshipped an American God. Might I submit to you today, not the God of America? But the God of the universe, the God who sent his one and only son to be for you. God is for you. Now, I personally struggle with this verse a little bit because I don't struggle believing that God is for me when I'm here at church. Of course, yeah, God is for me. Of course, man, it's good to see you, man. God bless you, brother. Yeah, God is for us. I struggle believing that God is for me in traffic. Because what's in my soul, I wouldn't call it road rage. I rebuke that. But I do got a little bit of fast and furious in my right foot. I'm just saying. Okay, just a little bit there. And God will test me and put me behind a Subaru, a Prius, a Corolla, a minivan in the far left lane. What are you doing over here? You don't belong here. You belong over there. But why are you going underneath the speed limit like you ain't got nowhere to be? You taking your precious time. And it is there on the Dallas North Tollway that I begin to wonder if God is for me. I don't have any problem believing that God is for me when I'm worshiping, but I do wonder if God is for me at my son's basketball game where I need a Xanax prayer and I just often go rogue. I could have somebody with me at the game, man. Man, come on to the game, man. Let's talk for a little bit, man. Hey, how you doing, man? How's your life? How's your family? What has God been doing in your life? Man, hey, that's a travel rep. What's wrong with you, Jackson? You better start playing some defense. Hey, man, a proverb a day will keep <laughs> the doctor away. Ref, are you out of your mind? Ryan, what a great message you had last week. No hable inglés. I don't know who you're talking about. It's not me. Aren't you a pastor? Of a covenant? Pastor of a covenant? No, it sounds like an awesome guy, though, but it's not me. Listen, I mean, no matter what I do, I just wonder every now and then at that gymnasium if God is exhausted from being for me, if his love has bounds. Like, I know he loves me, but I wonder if sometimes he likes me. I wonder if there are moments where God's going, Ryan, again, we got to do this again. Like, I don't know if you've ever had a moment in your spiritual journey where you felt like you were close to God one week, and then next week, you, you ran into that one person at work that's very special, and you just, you lost your mind, and then you just go, man, I, I just don't, where am I at with God week to week? 
depending on the song I sang or the verses I read, there's sort of this meter that kind of goes up and down, not knowing where we are with God. Can I set the record straight? God is for you. Now, this has been a thing for humanity for thousands of years. Ancient civilizations were trying to figure out what it meant to worship a god. And so they actually ended up with a lot of little gods. And they were trying to figure that out through forces of nature. So for a lot of them, they would say, wait a second, there's a burning flame in the sky that allows us to see, and then it goes away. We need that. That must be a god. There must be a sun god. So what do we need to do to keep the sun god on our side? But wait a second, we need rain. So there must be a rain God. So what must we give to the rain God to keep the rain God on our side? We need it for our crops. We need our animals to stay healthy. Wait, uh, sometimes women are able to have children, sometimes they're not. There must be a fertility God. And maybe if we just sacrifice enough to the fertility God, then then maybe we could get the gods on our side. And so these sacrifices began on mountaintops, and it was just too high for people. They said, we're not climbing up there. Okay, let's create temples for each God, and we'll put altars in there, and we'll bring our stuff to them, and maybe burn it up, and maybe that'll get the gods on our side. And so in ancient civilization, you'll see in Mesopotamia, they actually created all of these gods. They created a sun god, a rain god, a god of thunder, not Thor. Stay with me, okay? (laughs) A god of beer, a god of writing. It's amazing. You can make a god out of anything or anybody And so what these gods required was some sort of sacrifice. If it rained, it went, the rain god must be happy with this. And if there was a drought, there was a, did we do something to make the gods angry at us? What did we do? Maybe we should sacrifice more. Some even got to the point where they said, maybe we should just cut ourselves. Because maybe what the gods require is a blood sacrifice. These stories of God's requiring sacrifices is all throughout ancient history. And then there was a new story that emerged that absolutely changed the world. It was the story of the God of Abraham. He's different. Now in his story, uh, the God of Abraham does ask for a sacrifice. Except it's his son, not an animal. There's a new level to this thing. Wait a minute, there's this God that's asking for a man's son, to, for this God to be on his side. This is crazy. If, you, if you're familiar with the Genesis 22 text, the story of the God of Abraham, it's interesting. It says that in verse 2, God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. In verse 3, blows my mind. It says, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. No objection, no debate. He didn't even consult with his wife. Another sermon for another day. (laughs) He just moseys on on. Notice that there is no objection. Why? Because God's always asked for something. And that's how some people view religion. What does God want from me today? And so here comes Abraham with his one and only son going up the mountain, and he's getting ready to sacrifice his son. And then right before he goes to kill his son, God says, whoa, 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 stop. I'll provide the sacrifice. What? The first people hearing the story of the God of Abraham are going, wait, 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 wait a second. Your God requires a sacrifice but provides it? Who does that? Yeah, 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 this God's different. He actually provides the sacrifice to be on his people's side. So yes, if you're wondering why we call it good news, it's because our God sent his one and only son to die for you and for me. And so God is on your side, not because you did something special, but because he did something special. Maybe you came to church today and we're hoping that somebody would tell you that you're special, you're special, you're special, you're special. You're not special! He is. It's why we sing. And it's why we keep coming together. The reason why I want this verse to sink deep into your soul is because some of us are focusing all week not on who's for us, but who's against us. 
Some of us, the government's against us. Let's just say that's true. Are you willing to tell me with a straight face that you believe the government being against you is greater than God being for you? Some of us are going, oh, it's the school board, man, and this is against you. But who's for you? You're going, but Ryan, my HOA is against me. Okay, 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 okay. Look, are you trying to tell me that your HOA keeping you from putting a couple of flowers in your front yard is greater than God being for you? This will change how you go to work. The reason it will change the way you go to work is because you can go to work trying to get something from everybody, trying to earn something, trying to get people to be for you. Or you could go to work already knowing God is for me so I can love you with no agenda. I don't don't need to to get anything from you. And I love that we're only one verse in. Like, I I, I love Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 32, this is what he goes on to say to the church in Rome. He says, "Uh, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all? things. I don't know what you've heard about God, but he's a giver. Like you would think we would go, ah, he sent his one only son to die for you. That's all you ever need. True. But he's not done because that's his character. And I think a lot of us struggle with this text because we typically connect our heavenly father with our experience or lack thereof of our earthly one. So if you had a good dad, maybe you can connect it. But if you had a bad dad, you're like, you're telling me there's this all-powerful being who's in my corner that would empty out his savings account to be on my side? I don't even know what it looks like. My dad, I was fortunate enough to have a good one. He was not a wealthy one, but he was a good one. And this I knew all the days of my life. My dad was for me. I knew that if my dad had $10, I had $10. Like, we didn't have much, but the, much, the, but the little we did have, we all had it together. Now, maybe that was easy to do because we didn't have that much. It's like, well, we got $10? Okay, that means we got $10 this week. How do we want to spread that out amongst ourselves? You know, but nevertheless, I always knew that my dad was for me. And that's, that's inspired me to just, I want to be there for my kids. I want them to know I'm for them. I don't want them to think that they're in a performance-based relationship because some of us are in that with our parents. We have to perform to get their love. Good grades, score touchdowns. Um, my mom, uh, who's, who's here today, she always used to say, get your act together. I got company coming over. Who is this company that is coming by? <laughs> but there was this like, you know what I'm saying? Like you can have this thing in your mind that, oh, I, this, is, this must be how my, my God works. I have to do a bunch of stuff. No, 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 no. That's not how God does parenting. It's not how God plays the game. Our God is a giver. He's not going, okay, I've given you enough already. I I might want to spread this out somewhere else. We're thinking in earthly terms. You're talking about a God that breathes stars. You think he can't give you a healing? Some of us are afraid to pray because we're like, God, I just, it's the heavenly father that emptied out everything to be on your side. My oldest son, him and I uh, love basketball. We, we, we connect on all things basketball. Playing it, talking about it, NBA 2K24 came out on Friday. We've already created our characters and we made each other 6'10". Don't judge us. Now, <laughs> anytime I'm out and I see something that I think he'll like, I just get it for him. Now here's the deal, I don't always give it to him. What he doesn't know, and I'm so glad he's not in this service, Um, all around our house, my wife and I have hidden good things for him that he does not even know about. We have planned trips that he does not know about. We have planned meet and greets with professional athletes in January that he does not know about. Why? I can't help but love the kids. I'm always planning for him. And I'm an earthly dad from McKinney. How much more is our heavenly father not planning good gifts for you 
and for me. You might be looking at the scoreboard right now going, Ryan, it's not that good right now. Trust me, I know that our God has got some things stored up for us that we may not be able to see right now, but you just hold tight, baby. I'm telling you, our God is for us. He's a giver, he is generous, and he wants to bless your life. If he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor, how much more will he clothe you? If he watches over every sparrow, how much more does he love you? I love what the next verse says in verse 33. It says, uh, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who will bring any charge against whom those whom God has chosen. Can I encourage you today? You're chosen. You're called. You're chosen. And you should live like you're already chosen. Uh, single ladies, touch some sky really fast. Single ladies, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Some of you are like, I don't know, am I? <laughs> some of you got a situation ship. Am I? Am I? Tell them. Tell the church, Larry. Tell the church. Am I single? Should I lift my hand? Should I not? Touch some sky. About to get somebody in trouble today, boy. Like, I'm glad he asked. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Can I encourage every single lady under the sound of my voice? Do not wait for a man to choose you, to decide that you're going to live chosen. And some of us are putting our faith in being chosen. It will not do for your soul what you think it will do. You need to walk around like you have already been chosen. Now, if a man would like to come alongside you in partnering with what God has called you to do, and he's a little bit taller, a little bit of a baller, he shouldn't have a side chick so he could call her. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> if he got a couple of streams of income and love the Lord, if he wants to come alongside, it's a cherry on top. But it's not going to save your soul. And it's not going to pull you out of what you think it's going to pull you out of. Some of us are just waiting for somebody to choose us. No, you've already been chosen. Single man, raise your hand. Now we're really about to see what's going on in the church. <laughs> are you? Are you? Are you? Act like you've been chosen. You have too much of a high calling on your life to live your life in them streets. And I, and I just got to call you out just a little bit to say, no, act like you're chosen. Work like you're chosen. Treat women like you're chosen. Parent like you've been chosen. No, I've already been picked. Go to work like you've been chosen. Some of us are going, man, if I just get that promotion, what is it going to do for your soul? But imagine if you walked into that interview, I'm already chosen. You can give me the title, great. If not, it's not going to do for my soul what has already been done for my soul. Act like you already won because you did. Act like you've already been chosen because you were. Today's about getting your confidence back. Because sometimes we can allow the things that happen in this world to take it from us hoping that somebody swipes for us. No, somebody already died for us. Somebody already chose us. Somebody, we already won the eternal jackpot. You already won. And yet you and I will be tempted to do all of these other things to get chosen. Um, I, I get an opportunity to speak all around corporate America. I'm kind of like a pastorpreneur. I'm trying to figure out my life. Bear with me. Listen, each and every week I have agents that present my name to companies all around the world. And uh, some weeks, companies choose me, and some weeks, they don't. And I'd be like, why don't you choose me? Huh? What's going on? What's happening? And then I am very much tempted to do things to get chosen. Look at me. See? I'm awesome. Like, choose me. Somebody hit me up on Instagram this week. They said, for $2,000, we will put you on the front cover of this notable magazine, and we will title you Top 40 entrepreneurs under 40. I said, say what? 
That sounds kind of nice. Got a little ring to it. 40 under 40. Ryan, how did you do this? I can't tell you my secrets. You are what you are. You know what I mean? Like, I'm tempted to, like, manipulate the system to just so somebody can choose me. But wait a minute. I've already been chosen. And here's, I've done business long enough to know this. God has everybody's phone numbers that needs me to speak to their company, and he can call them anytime he wants and put me on whoever's mind and hearts. I trust God with my future, not my posting. Magic tricks. No, I'll be a good steward of the platforms and gifts God has given me. I'm not talking about changing your actions. I'm talking about changing your posture to say, God is for me, and I am already chosen. What would it look like for you to walk around like you've already been chosen? I love what verse 34 says. It says, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Get this picture in your mind. Imagine that you are before a judge and you are guilty. And your lawyer says, hey, I'll pay his price. I'll go to jail for them. I'll defend them and take the penalty. The picture that the Apostle Paul is painting for the first century church of Rome is going, when God sees you, he sees Jesus first, interceding for us. Hey, Dad, I know, I know, I know, I know. Ryan can be a little exhausting. I get it, but I paid for it in blood, in red. I I know, I know, I know, I know. But remember, you sent me, and I didn't have to go. I volunteered, so here I am. Lord, I love you. I, brothers and sisters, yeah, like interceding for us. Just imagine that the next time you want to wallow in the guilt of anything you've ever done. And then I love what Romans 8 verse 35 says. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall trouble or hardship, or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger in sword? If you are familiar with this text that has often been preached or said out loud, what shall separate us from the love of Christ. But it's a who before it's a what. I've often found that it's often a who that gets in our head that will create some separation between us and our Savior. Somebody told you that you weren't good enough. Somebody told you that you needed to get your act together before you could even go to church. Somebody told you that you didn't just make a mistake, but that you are a mistake. Somebody told you that your job wasn't good enough, that you aren't even a real man, that you don't deserve to be loved, that you don't deserve to have a higher position. Somebody got in your head. It made you believe that you were less than what you are. And I think that's why you came to church this weekend. I think that's why you turned us on. I think that's why you clicked on the link. So that you could hear a message about just how much God is for you, chose you, and loves you. So we can't let a who separate us from the love of God. Then he moves on to some what. What does he mention? He mentions uh, hardships. He mentions persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. I want to do just a quick word study with you if you're taking notes. When he's referring to nakedness there, this term today suggests indecency on parade. (laughs) But then it meant lack of clothes or simply being in a position where you lacked the ways of getting any clothes. The area of our life that we just go, I just don't have enough resources to be who God has called me to be. Yeah, that cannot separate you from the love of God. In fact, some of us, uh, we connect God's love for us based off of how much money we make. It's the measuring stick. How much is he blessing me? That is where the love. No, that's not something that's supposed to separate you. It's just another thing that can keep us 
from connecting with our God. The other word I want us to dive into is the word sword. We're not just thinking about just the word sword. This word implies execution. It's the only item that Paul had yet to experience when writing this letter. And the Roman government ruled with an iron fist and an iron sword. This was the government having their, their thumb on top of the people of God. And I just, I know, I pray for every politician, and I, I know there can be lots of talk about the government, but you and I cannot let what's happening in the White House separate us from the love that God wants us to have in this house. You and I have to be the kinds of people that go, wait, man, what are some of the things, what are some of the, dare I say, distractions that are keeping us from the love of God? Romans 8, verse 36 says, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, now the apostle Paul is quoting Psalms 44, 22 to inspire the church in Rome. He's going, hey, hey, here's the deal. I know that you are facing a lot of hardships right now. I know that you are facing persecution, but guess what? You are not the first generation to face persecution. So don't shrink back. Let me tell you who you really are. You are a warrior, and we face death. What does that mean? It means we can look at the worst circumstances and go, you are not winning today. I will worship on this side of eternity or the next, but on both sides, I will continue to honor God, period. I am a warrior. And this is the precursor to a, a famous verse that a lot of people are familiar with, with Romans 8, verse 37. It says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors through him who loved us. Uh, there were several emperors of Rome that were seen as conquerors that shaped Roman history. Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Tiberius. Um, the, the emperor, conqueror that was in charge when the apostle Paul was writing the book of Romans was an emperor named Nero. Here's the kicker with Nero. Nero was 16 years old when he became emperor. He was 19 years old when this letter was written. Imagine a 16-year-old being in charge of one of the most vitriolic armies in the world. Young, immature, ruthless, debaucherous is what some historians would call him, ruthless. And there could be this fear of like, well, well what's this little kid going to do? What's this teenager going to do? Like, and, and you just, you think about some of these, these conquerors, these emperors that built the Colosseums, and like, they just seem so powerful, to which... The Apostle Paul is coming along saying, like, yeah, those powerful people, yeah, you are powerful more than they. Don't get it twisted. It ain't because you're awesome. It's because he is. He says you're more than a conqueror through what? Through him who loved us. Love got us a place power never could. Don't get it twisted. What looks like power ain't always real power. A conqueror might be able to control an army or God controls the heavens. Which one would you want on your side? If you look throughout the Old Testament, whoever God was on the side of, they always won. Oh, and, oh by the way, if God's in the fight, he don't fight fair. Look it up. <laughs> one time he was throwing hailstones from heaven. How are you going to throw it back? <laughs> Nothing. You're done. It's over. It's not close. That God is on your side. Through him who loved us. What would you do if I told you that you got nothing to prove? Oh, what, what would happen? How would you go to work if you knew that you were already more than the thing you think you need to work so hard to become? You're already more than that. Except you didn't have to earn it. Once again, it's why we call it good news. I love this verse so much because... I think it changes the way we see ourselves, and I believe it can also change the way that other people see us. It gives us confidence knowing God is for me, he chose me, and there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. Listen, I sing and I give and I try to be what's quote unquote a good Christian, not to get God on my side. That, that, that deal was already done. I do all of those things 
because he's already on my side. It's a response. It's not going, hey God, you see me today? Yeah. I sang earlier, I don't know if you heard that song, More Than Able. Yep, I think that, and, and maybe, maybe the God will be on my side. No, if you're wondering if the God of the universe is on your side today, look no further than the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the only reason why you and I continue to gather together. I love what Romans 8 verse 38 says. It says, for I am convinced, Ryan translation, I am for show knowing that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My mom shared with me earlier this week. She said, Ron, have you read that in the message? It's, it's such a beautiful phrase. It says, none of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing, no thing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. When the apostle Paul wrote, the verse we just read, he had been facing grueling times because he was a Christian. He had suffered rejection from his friends, persecution from the government, had spent many months isolated in a prison. But regardless of what people or the circumstances of his life did to him, Paul had discovered this vital truth. There ain't nothing in life that can happen that can separate a believer from the love of God. Death can't stop it. No angel or demon can stop it. And I love in the message, he says, today or tomorrow. Let's talk about today. What's standing in your way today is not strong enough to separate you from the love of God. Shall we move on to tomorrow? The unknown future, some of the things that we worry about, guess what? What is going to happen in the future cannot separate you from the love of God. Then he continues to neither height nor depth. And now we're looking a little bit, we're getting a little bit of a Greek study here. The word height is the Greek word hapsuma, which expresses the notion of something that is overhead. Is there anything looming over your head? Perhaps some mistakes, perhaps some limitations that feels like a ceiling between you and the love of God. Can I encourage somebody today? Do not let the shame of yesterday keep you from the promise of tomorrow. God has a future for you. And maybe, maybe you cheated. Maybe you stole something. And maybe you messed up. But the love of God is still on the table for you. I was talking to a man the other day. And he said, Ryan, I, I destroyed my family, man. I messed up big time. I said, man, I'm sorry to hear that. He said, yeah, man, I destroyed my family. I said, well, hold on a second. Are they alive? He said, yeah, 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 they're alive. I said, are they standing? He said, yeah. I said, well, then we need new language. Destroyed. They alive, bro. I said, let me give you some new language. He goes, like, well, well like what? I go, how about I'm rebuilding my family? I made some mistakes, and you got a long journey ahead of you for sure. However, God is still for you, and you can start heading in the right direction. Yeah, you can take some responsibilities for some mistakes that you made, but guess what? God's love is still on the table for you, and you can move in a positive direction. God does have a future for you. God does have a future for your family. Contrary to popular belief, you'd be surprised what God could turn around. You'd be surprised what God could do in a family. You'd be surprised how God could show up at your house and your address, and he knows where you live. So don't, don't fall for the mistake of believing that God can't turn that around, and you can just have this thing that's just looming over you. Yeah, 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 that, that height can't separate you from the love of God. Depth is the word bathos, kind of like a bath. It's the Greek word that expresses the notion of something that is exceedingly deep. Like think about the deepest parts of the sea where it gets so dark. And I know a lot of people that find themselves in a very, very dark place. 
but it ain't too deep. And it ain't too dark for the love of Jesus Christ to come get you right where you're at. You came to church for a reason today. Somebody sent you this link today for a reason. I don't care how depressed you are. I don't care how much pressure you got. I don't know if anxiety has led you to a hospital room. God's love can meet you right in that, in that hospital room, and it'll be waiting for you at home when you get there. That's the God we serve. Last word study of the day. Can you handle one more Greek word? The word separate is the Greek word chorizo, not chorizo. I know some of you hungry, say chorizo, thank you, Jesus. I need chorizo in my life. No, no, no. Chorizo with the, with the D-Z-O, meaning to sunder, to sever, to disunite, to tear apart, to disconnect, to cut off, to disengage, to withdraw. Nothing can do that. I know you've had a lot of challenges in your life. I know you've had to sing through some disappointment. But don't let anything, any relationship, any divorce, any job loss, or any mistake allow you to disconnect, cut off, disengage, or withdraw from the love of God. I love how Romans 8.31 in the message says it. He says, so, what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? God is for you. God is for you. I don't know what you heard. God is for you. Even when you're your own worst enemy, even when you're not for you, God is for you. Your family may not have been for you. God is for you. Your job may not have been for you. God is for you. God is for you. God is for you. God is for you. Let it sink in your soul. Let it sink in your brain. You are loved. You are chosen. There is nothing that can separate you from it. I hope you walk away with a little confidence today. Not in what you've done, but in what Christ has done for us. Stand to your feet. I want us to be able to respond to today's message in worship. And we're going to sing a little bit of more than able again. Can you imagine with all of the faith in the room, what the Lord can do. Who, who are we? Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? God can do the impossible in your life. And I believe God is on the move. God is for you. God is for you. God is for you. God is for you. He is more than able to do exceedingly and abundantly what you can think or imagine. Father, in these next few moments, I pray that we would trust you, that we would know that you're for us. May it change the way we work. May it change the way that we love. May it change the way that we think. May it change the way that we treat people. May we know that you emptied out the heavens for us, not because we're special, but because you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it.
Can you imagine with the faith in this room right now what the Lord can do right now? What a great word. He is able. He is able. He is able. Can you imagine? He's still doing miracles today. My Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, to him, speaking of God, to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything you can think of or imagine. He is able. He is able. He is able. Listen, I don't know what you need today, but he, he's able right now to heal your body standing right here, right now. He's able to restore your marriage standing right here, right now. He's able to repair that relationship with that lost child right now. He is able. Listen, he's able to break addiction right now. Listen, if you need to see God move in your life right now, whatever that situation is, just raise your hand in this house right now. Come on, all over this place. Father, you are able. You see the hands of your people. Father, we know you are more than able to do miracles right now. Restore and marriages, uh, repair relationships, break addiction. Father, let healing flow in this house right now because you are able to do it today and you choose to touch your people in this house today. Father, we love you. We worship you and you are able. Come on, I want you to declare that. God, you are able. Come on, declare it over your own life. You are able to break through for me right now. What a great message. You got something to go home with today. I'm chosen. I'm loved. And you are able, God. You know what the greatest miracle of all is the fact that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross so we could receive our salvation. See, he's already chosen you. Jesus already did the hard part. Our part is easy, and it's simply this. Romans chapter 10 says this. If we believe in our heart that Jesus died on the cross and that God raised him three days later to life, and that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, it simply says, I will be saved. Today, there's someone in this house that needs to make that choice. You see, God already chose you. The question is, with your life, will you give it to him and will you choose him today? With every head bowed and every eye closed, in just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer together. But I'd be remiss not to give an opportunity to somebody in here. Your heart may be pounding right now. That's the Holy Spirit saying, this is your day. No one's looking around. It's between you and God. In just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer together. But on the count of three, I'm just going to look across this audience. And if you're that person, say, I choose God today to be my Savior and my Lord, then we're going to pray a prayer together. One, two, three. I'm looking across this room. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking, thank you, sir. Yes, yes, thank you in the back there. Come on, I'm going across. Don't, don't miss the moment. I'm going to look across the, the uh, uh, balcony right now. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Come on, I have four or five or six. I don't know, I'm not keeping count. Come on, I'm going to, there's someone else. I'm going to look one more time across this. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, yes, I see that there. Come on, God's working. Yes, thank you. I see that young lady right there. Come on. I knew there were more. Come on, we're going to pray this prayer together all out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for choosing me. I believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross 
for me. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I believe you raised him from the dead to give me life. Today, I receive that new life in Jesus. Today, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord of my life. And today, I can boldly say that I am saved. Come on. What a great celebration. What a great decision you made today. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with us today, we as the family of God that you're a part of, we, we want to walk this journey with you. I want to encourage you to text all caps, the word SAVED, to 54636. And we're going to send you a seven-day devotional that will help you get started on this journey. We want to walk it with you. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come down front as we get uh, prepared to dismiss. If you made that prayer today, come in an agreement with one of these prayer partners. Or if you need prayer for anything, uh, the Bible says if any two of us agree together in the name of Jesus, it shall be done. We want to pray with you. Man, what a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? A great word. Hey, I want to encourage the men uh, this evening at 7 o'clock. We're going to have a, right here in our east wing, we're going to have a cowboy watching party. I believe we need a cowboy praying party because I'm not convinced yet that they're going to be what they say they are, but we'll see. Men, if you want to come and join us, we'd love to have you. There's going to be food, wings, all, pizza, all kinds of stuff. We'll have a good time at 7 o'clock tonight. Hey, let me bless you as we go today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may he cover you in his precious name, the name of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I receive that. Be blessed. Have a great Sunday.